do you think that there's a major difference between the audiences in Canada and, and like LA or the United States? No, you know what it is. Um, imagine you are talking to your friends and laughing in the living room and let's say your grandmother or an older person that was a friend of yours was in the other room and started and walked in and said, what are you guys laughing about? Tell me, but I want to get in on this. Are you going to tell your grandmother the same, the joke, the same way you spoke to your friends? <laughs> Definitely not. No, no, for sure. No, no, you would actually translate it English to English, mm -hmm. friends, English to grandmother, English. Mm -hmm. There's no different from what that is happening. What I do. Yeah. I'm translating English to English in different parts of the world. Yeah. Everybody speaks English, but grandmother's English is different from your friend's English, is different from your dad's English, is different from your girlfriend's English. You, every crowd is different. And if you don't pick that up on that, you're going to eventually bomb so hard in a place mm -hmm. that you think you're going to kill at a time where you're supposed to kill so you can get more work. And if you don't think that you have to change, as a comedian, you could do your local or specific type of rhythm and uh, the same way yeah. everywhere. It's not going to work. Why? No. Because sections and demographics and parts of the world are just different in senses of humor and rhythm. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you uh, think? I equate it to wrestling. Sorry. Do, what do you think that like like with a Filipino audience? Do you, what what are some like? Is there like significant cultural differences that would make yeah. it like you have to like go at a joke in a different way? For sure. Let's let's talk about that in two art forms. One art form is stand up comedy, uh, a North America of art form mm -hmm. that had went through the f one liners, vaudeville, for sure, anecdotal. Eddie Murphy, Richard Pryor, mm -hmm. Bill Hicks, you know, the progression of comedy, like any sport, has, has, has doubled in and tripled an idea. So to come up with an original idea today, if you want to just talk about the art of stand-up comedy, yeah. it's really hard. You're, you're competing with the Bill Burrs, the CKs, yeah. the, the Chris Rocks, Mm -hmm. the Chappelle's right so you're yeah. competing with that level of of in uh, of creativity right mm -hmm. so in that aspect that is different but the, a cool hip audience can determine what you're doing in comedy you're like I seen people destroy LA New York in the coolest crowds you got yeah. but then die on the road with me and they know it and I know it they're talking about stuff and also a rhythm of things uh, and a rhythm that that small crowd is not used to, right? And that that, that, mm -hmm. that uh, small town is not used to. So that's one part of uh, the pushing the envelope, being hip to the latest and greatest type of comedy, For sure. which could be an outfit, which could be a style, could be a personality, could be a character, but it also is, it is coincides with the, right, the jokes you write. Mm -hmm. Now, the Filipino community, or maybe, let's say, ethnic community, that yeah. could be Middle Eastern, Indian, Asian, sure. Filipino, whatever. They're not up to that standard. They don't even know that. They haven't had the experience, Filipino. right? Yeah. Yeah. They, it's not even, it, they look at comedy differently. They look at it as anecdotal. It's a very uh, happy uh, way of doing comedy. Mm -hmm. It's a very... Ba it's not basic. What it is is that's original comedy first. Exactly. Comedy originally was let's entertain you and make you happy. Yeah, and they sure. like it on that level. But 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 comedy has evolved like food. Uh, like you know, it's evolved to this. Um, tell us something that we're bothered by. Tell us something that we hate. Tell us something that the absurdities of life. Tell me something that is happy too, but tell me something that reflects what we're going through right now, emotionally, politically, socially. We, we, we want all that, like art, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, so that's the big difference. Now you could bring them up to speed because you've proved to them. Mark Marion Mark Mar used to go to Yuck Yucks and he would, we, he, he would start easy and mm -hmm. then eventually he'd go really hard and he said, you know what? 
these uh, these uh, Toronto crowds are pretty hip. I'm, and tomorrow, I'm going to start hard. Let's see what happens. And I, I watched every one of his shows. He started hard, and they were with him. He's like, yeah, this doesn't work in small, a small wow. town. The small town is like doing comedy in 1980, where yeah. they want comedy at its sleeves. Mm -hmm. They want to understand. They want to relate, right? A very uh, observational comedy is very easy to do in a small town. Small towns are opposite from the big city, whereas a small town wants to hear a song mm -hmm. that they've heard before. Nostalgia. Oh, she's got a fast machine. I love that song from the 80s. Let's all sing. It's like that scene from the from the James Plays in Automobiles where Steve Martin and John Candy are in that truck uh, in that bus, and yep. they they they're all singing. All the passengers are singing with John Candy. Meet the Flintstones and have a yabba dabba do time. And then mm -hmm. when when it's Steve Martin, he's like. She's now he's singing some kind of like this cool, uh, maybe ja may, may, maybe mm -hmm. uh, more f sophisticated song. Yeah, and everybody goes, uh, "Shut the fuck up! What are you talking about?" <laughs> See, that's a city guy. That's a city yeah. guy. So a city comic is the same way. A city comic, the city audience wants to hear something new, innovative, something they've never heard before. Right, and maybe a bit of nostalgia. But sure. you don't. You, you, but you, they they understand when you're when you're pandering too. So they're like, uh, okay, enough of the nostalgia. Give me something new, like the news. It's this, been the, the, yeah. The, it's been interesting to see up here a community that is very sort of new to like comedy. That like I mean, everybody has access to the internet, so you're able to sort of experience it when you want to. But for the most part, they're they're they aren't put in a position where they're sort of forced to sort of like bump up against like opposing ideas and different types of comedy. So they're really only clicking on maybe on the things online or Netflix that like they know or they they already like. But it's funny to watch them sort of like come to the comedy festival and I, and I like to throw in some like subversive comedians in the middle of these shows and to watch them sort of like sort of spread their knowledge of what like comedy can be. And it's this right. town, this town is like 20 years behind for sure. Well, I mean, it's no different than, um, it just takes us, uh, it's like this Singapore and Malaysia started comedy in night around 10 12 years ago wow they're veterans it. yeah well it started with russell peters what happened when, when russell blew up he went mm -hmm. to all these places that never had actual stand-up comedy. they never heard of it before they've wow. heard of it but they never seen it live it wasn't yeah. a part of their culture and then they were like holy shit uh can we well can we keep doing this he's not coming back till next year or two years <laughs> yeah let's let's bring other comedians that are not russell but we look online so they brought mm -hmm. me 12 years ago Wow. 12 years ago was the first, well, let's say 2004 was the first time I went, I started going overseas. I was doing China. Mm -hmm. I was doing uh, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, the Middle East, you know, Bahrain and, and Abu Dhabi. It's, it's my first, all, first time was Dubai. My first time ever going to overseas was Dubai in 2004. They wow. saw me online and said, we had Russell Peters here. We would like to bring other comedians we never heard of. They built their comedy clubs in reflection to the comedy clubs in New York that they went to. Oh, wow, really? So the owner, yeah, the owners of Singapore, they all went to Just for Laughs. They all went to New York. They went to LA to, to look. And to, this is 15 years ago. They're like, oh, so this is stand-up comedy. Uh, it's a culture here. They, their clubs look like our clubs. Really? Yeah, man. They, wow. they built it. Like, there, there's one club in India called The, the Canvas that was used to be called the comedy store because the owner <laughs> went to the comedy store in England and copied it exactly how it looked like. Wow. Yeah. So it's so got like it brick walls exactly and everything and everything. It looks exactly like the com. So the comedy store in England looks like the belly room. No, it looks mm -hmm. like the, uh, uh, looks like the main room in the comedy store in LA. So the oh, wow. person from England copied it from LA and the person from India copied it from uh, London. Wow. So when I went there, I'm like, what the fuck? This feels exactly like where, you know, you feel <laughs> like you're in, in the US or Canada. That's crazy. So, yeah. So their, their veterans are only are 12 years old. They bring headliners in. They, see, only now that the local comedy scene has started to headline their local comics because it's been 12 years. Now those guys, I, I almost equated to the Nubian show, Kenny Robinson's the, Black comedy show in, in, in Toronto. Yeah. Uh, originally, they brought 
headliners from the U.S. because there was nobody that could headline. Mm-hmm. Maybe a few. Evan Carter, old school guy. Uh, fucking uh, Ronnie Edwards. Russell Peters was still new. Maybe 10 years in, not even eight years in. And then eventually, the people grew up and they're headlining. So that's the same thing that's happening in Malaysia. Malaysia, these new comics that started 15 years ago are now headlining. But I used to be the headliner. And they still bring me back. I'm, but For their sure. veterans are still 12 years old. They have That's learned crazy. comedy like how we like uh, we learn comedy. So their favorite comics are our favorite comics. So they are teaching. Your local comedians eventually will be the teachers of comedy in your mm-hmm. scene. Yeah. And yeah. they will be the front of the lines, you know, uh, uh, of what comedy is. Any open micer in any city knows comedy so well because they're fans of their fans and students of it when when i started you were just a fan of comedy you weren't a student of comedy you just you just wanted to make people laugh now everybody's a fan and a and a student so when you start comedy now you kind of know everything well exactly yeah you've got some of the background knowledge you've heard enough people talk about it in interviews like you've got sort of a lot of the like thought process behind it so you're coming in with some knowledge already right and so when i when i started going to malaysia uh, so when Russell Peters opened the door, then I started going and, you know, all these comics that are all across the U.S. and Canada and U.K. and Australia were coming down as the headliners, right? Uh, we, they, they are, they're now learning uh, comedy as we're learning it because it's just like the virus. It really is. What I learned from here, the audience will learn from Europe audience, Singapore audience, Middle East audience, every audience will learn because I'm learning from here. I'm bringing the virus of comedy to everyone. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. Ron, uh, Ron Jossel, the, the coronavirus of comedians. Comedy. Co Ron virus of comedy. <laughs> <laughs> are you noticing any of these like small like uh, any of these like southeast asian countries and stuff who are just starting to get into comedy like are you noticing them getting their own sort of unique voices yet or is that yeah 100 100 percent. like i i've i met so many comedians 15 years ago who are now headliners who are now their own versions of russell peters in their own cities and countries mm-hmm like and I know, you think that there's like a like an like an Indian almost type of comedy, or like even like sub, even smaller than that. But like, do you think that there's like their own type of sort of like humor that's coming out of that? Uh, no, because it's, it, it, this is what it is about comedy, you no know, stand up comedy overseas. They saw it as a North America art form, so they want to keep it mainly in English, yeah. right? Or the sensibility is still North American, yeah. Because it's, the sensibility outside of North American comedy is another type of comedy it's oh, yeah. like japan japan has this own type of comedy that's that's been around every country has comedy yeah. that but they don't have stand-up comedy mm-hmm. stand-up comedy as an art form is a north america arts form so they try to mimic it or at least at least honor it the same way so it's like wine uh, from france or something mm-hmm. like like when if you have all these wines i don't know if the best wines from france i'm just guessing uh, and you go, oh, well, I got this from France. And everybody be like, oh, my God, that's the real one. Yeah. You know, so comedy in North America is like wine overseas. Wow, like for, yeah. You know, so like when they bring an American or a Canadian, they're like, oh, this is real. This is the real one, guys. Oh, that's you know? so cool. That's 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 so interesting. I, I think that like, I equate it to like when hip hop came to the UK and they first started, right. they were even doing like American accents and like things like that. And now they've, they've almost like, I mean, there's obviously still like acts that like sort of cross over between both, but I, I, I it's been interesting because then now they have sort of their own culture of hip hop that is like completely different. And it's like just the UK hip hop and, it, and, and it, it's, it's their own thing. And, and I wonder if it will get to a point where it's like, this is what like, these countries like stand-up comedy is like and it's sort of like more cultural references to things that make sense to them and like in their own sort of perspectives and voices like i'm curious to see what that is like 20 years from now you know what i mean yeah and and you know what it's it's they're 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 their biggest comedians out there that Mm -hmm. their versions of russell peters that that could sell up stadiums and whatnot yeah talk more about the politics of their countries yeah 
um, as as that's their edgy, 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 edgy shit. You know where I mean, that ours was ours, is, right? Like that was ours, yeah. like fifteen years ago. Like we were just sort of like fifteen, twenty years ago. We were just like getting back into like super political comedy and things like that. And I think we've sort of we've sort of like are tapering out of that now. I think because people are just so sick of like hearing constant politics. Like I wonder what North America looks like post coronavirus because are people going to be tired of just constantly talking about politics i i think i think what happens is like an implosion of comedy in north america because of all the different types of tv shows and netflix and yeah. underground comics and youtube so every comic you may not even know who this person is but they probably are are making more than 95 percent of the comedians in north america wow because they have an underground following, whether it's an ethnic thing or or they 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 blew up on YouTube or blew up blew, blew up uh like what's his name from New York City he uh what's his name he's a guy that has every one of his IG posts has 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 him doing stand up with the actual words. Oh yeah 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 I I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, what is that? Is it Schultz? Andrew Schultz? Yeah. Yeah. Andrew Schultz. So he's blown up because of the internet because of the way he started promoting himself in ig through the perfect camera angles of three shots mm -hmm. with the perfect timing uh, time of how, how long each bit should be mm -hmm. and he writes out his jokes so if you're on the subway or in a car or walking you don't have to listen to it you can just read it you know so a guy like him has blown up because of that and um I think what's happening in America or North America is you have a lot of subculture comedy and a lot of c comics that are big that you may not know of because, you know, in the improv, especially the super improvs that have 600 to a thousand people seating mm -hmm. at night, I'll look through the list. Like, okay. Joe Rogan's here. So Silver, Silverman's here. Joker's here. Blah, 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 blah. I don't know. Who the fuck is this person? And they're like, well, we don't really know, but we just know they can sell this out every day of the week. It's like those I YouTube heard, stars, right? It's like when like, exactly. co when like comedy festivals suddenly put on these YouTube stars. They're like, I don't know who this is, but they seem to have a, lot, a huge following. Yeah. I mean, and who, you know, as a promoter, you, the only reason why you want to have 600 to 1,000 seats a night is because you need to accommodate a crowd mm -hmm. that a certain comic star or non can fill. Yeah. You know, you're, you're just all, all about bringing the biggest names and biggest mm -hmm. numbers. You're not going to say no to that, but the comedy mm -hmm. community is a different community. It's not a pro promoting community, a comedy a community. Yeah. It's not marketing. It's not a business. They're, they're purely art form artists. And mm -hmm. you know, so they'll say that's bullshit. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. But are you going <laughs> to be, the bill you know but but freeman's bills yeah exactly right who's gonna who's gonna cast those checks at the end of the day that's what's yeah, important you your, your 10 people that that follow you, mm -hmm. you they need a five thousand people yeah a week you know just to fucking make some money those guys are gonna suffer more i believe you know i mean joe rogan's talking about opening up his own comedy club where you have to walk in and you have to show that you've already been tested and these to put a laser Crazy. beam to your yeah. But then, and every couple, every two people have to be separated by six feet. And so maybe you can only put 50 to 100 people a night. You know, maybe there'll be yeah. a gra glass screen on, on the fucking com in front of the comic. Like, like, like in the south with like the fence uh, uh, so that you could throw the beer bottles at them. Yeah. Yeah. But just glass. You yeah. Know? Like <laughs> those bands that play in the fucking, you know, whatever. But maybe that's the new version of comedy. Maybe comedy is going to turn more. Uh, see, I've been doing a lot of comedy online lately because mm -hmm. people have been asking me to whether it's free or not. But we get money in some shows. Some shows you make fifty bucks. Some some shows you make three hundred. Right? Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. Because the Zoom allows you to keep going. Because you, you, you can charge for people to like uh, attend to the Zoom call, right? So for sure, you could also say you can donate. So a lot of yeah. the places I do, these there's a donation, mm -hmm. and there's um, the minimum shows I've done at thirty people, and I've made fifty dollars. That's not bad. Five comedians, you know, and then the mil the the most I've had was three hundred people, and I made on a two three hundred dollars, right? Yeah. Uh, it's not as easy as as being on stage naturally. What happens is you have to make sure, and for the ultimate 
reaction and, and, and to actually make people interested and actually make them get into this and invest in this, the background has to be nice. The audio has to be nice. There can't be too much moving. Yeah. You know, and, and if you want to do anything physical, physical, you have to zoom back. You know, <laughs> it, it's, it's no, it's no, it's all, it, it, you've turned into your own camera person. That's totally true. I was talking to Dave Mahaj about that because he was struggling with sort of like the idea of doing it because he's such a physical comedian. He like runs like around the stage and things like what that. What you need to do is put his phone on a tripod. Yeah. Have a have some drapes or a one color black around like any audition tape. Yeah. And he would have to do his comedy full bodied like an audition tape so he could run around like a psycho. <laughs> do you think that like this is going to spur like a new type of comedy when all this is it, over? It already has. If if it, 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 in a weird way, if you're not doing this right now, you're not making any money. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm maybe making, you know, a bit under a. Th maybe 500 to 500 bucks right now a month yeah but but who knows what's this this i don't think this will stop because the the virus hasn't stopped and the people are not are not are not uh comfortable being in public yet yeah but if this is the new norm for now this is gonna this is gonna be an art form so the stuff we're doing right now in a year from now so i'm I, i'm doing these shows with jp uh online called the Minority Report. Yeah. Now, there's 300 people a week watch this. A week. Wow, we're that's given, awesome. We're given four segments to talk about. First, the intro, who you are, and how, and make, and joke about, for three minutes, one to three minutes, talk about something that happened that affected you through the coronavirus. Make it fucking oh, wow. funny. Yeah. The second segment is a hot topic, whether that week was the Tiger King or Too Hot to Handle TV show. Mm-hmm or Michael Jordan's documentary, or Drake's new video. That's a hot topic. Yeah. Number three is, uh, number three would be something like, uh, we're doing this meme. No, number three is a, a meme thing where you get, a, you, you get a picture and we all tag it on, on our own version of a meme. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a great idea. Yeah, and then there's a speed meme where we never got to rehearse this, but they go, you, you, what do you think? And if you can't get it, you can't get it, but it's a real, right? And then the third is a question and answer with the, a fourth is a question and answer with the audience. So there's a couple questions and we all have a chance to, and that's an hour, they donate. You know, they donate $10 wow. each to this four, three, 400 people. So it's not stand-up comedy anymore, but it's something it, it just as entertaining, if not more right now, because stand-up yeah. comedy you lose a lot of factors when you're watching it live because yeah. there's no audience reaction. Mm -hmm. An audience reaction makes you keep going. An audience reaction also allows people in the audience to laugh through contagiousness. Yeah. For when sure. there's none of, none of that, they have to, they have to laugh within. Mm -hmm. you remember watching a late night show and you're mm -hmm. actually laughing in your head, but you're not laughing physically. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. So we have to get used to that silence. Mm hmm. And we yeah. have to be okay with that. We can't be offended. We can't be upset. We can't go, oh my God, the reaction is not good enough because there's no reaction. Have you done one of those, the Zoom shows where all the audience is invited into the call? Yeah, for sure. There was like, uh, oh, oh uh, not, not, they're all muted because it would, okay. you couldn't hear yourself. If they, if they were all unmuted, you would hear babies crying. You would hear people yeah. cooking, talking. You, it, you wouldn't be able to hear because we tried it and you can't hear Anything. Really? Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, that would totally make sense. Because I would just be like, if you charge them, maybe they would shut up and only laugh when it, but I guess I'll, it would be so loud when it's all the exact same level as you're talking on the camera. Yeah. Some people were in traffic. So when someone's oh in traffic, God. what you hear is like people <laughs> honking, yeah, that's uh, not good. honking their, cor their horns, right? So I, 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 I think that comedy has changed it is changed already and will mm. cause like i mean i don't know what's going to happen to the big stars of comedy that make their money through selling yeah you know stadiums and people uh, look if your income is selling out theaters or comedy clubs every weekend and making i'm not two hundred thousand dollars a week yeah you're making 12 million a year 15 million a year because or 20 million a year because you're doing a thousand to 10,000 seated audiences once a month plus the comedy clubs. If that shut down, 
you have no more you basically you can't do a 50 seated audience no you're gonna go back to that do you think do you think chris rock or do, okay i get alternative comedy because all comics would do it mia mm -hmm. bamford has done it for two people i mean you know yeah i mean yeah uh, she's yeah that was amazing yeah absolutely she was she was ahead of her time yeah um if you don't do comedy like that where it's taped for people under 50 and then then use youtube mm. or amazon or hulu or fucking the disney plus how the fuck are you going to make money because it's no longer going to be outside no well, that's the thing right like it completely changes the whole game it actually makes the shittier comics on the same level as the great comics right now when it comes to audience uh, that's what out. i've heard too and i, I the, one of the things that i keep hearing from a lot of comedians is like it's going to be really interesting like when we're sort of post COVID and uh, everyone's trying to make their like coronavirus jokes, you're really going to be able to see who the bad comedians are because <laughs> oh, everyone's yeah. going to have the same cultural experience and the same sort of thing. So everyone's got the same thing to try to make a joke about it. hundred percent. Like w w what happens to the comics like Taylor Tomlinson that was coming up hard fast. Yeah. And like what if she doesn't have any more following after this? It's because tough. hype, hype really, if you put a, a damper, if you put a, a wet cloth on hype, yeah, it doesn't hype back the same way. I'm not, I'm not saying it won't, but I'm just saying every hot girl that I met that didn't <laughs> like me and liked me a year after, I didn't like them the same way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get what I'm, you're I'm saying. Like, What's Ron? That's all you wanted. That's all you talked about for two years. Mm -hmm. I don't know, man. Yeah, it's not the same. Yeah, yeah. I don't see her as the same way I saw her as I, back then. Like, if a girl waits too long or she's not interested in you, and and then and then comes back, you're like, it would have been great when I really wanted you that time because it's kind of like this. I love jerk chicken, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. And, and, <laughs> right. And mm -hmm. if I'm craving jerk chicken and I can't, and I want it so badly that you give it to me, I'd be so happy. But the next day I may not crave it anymore. <laughs> I love that you just compared women <laughs> to jerk chicken. <laughs> 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 yeah, but, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, so the hype, you know, I wanted Taylor Tomlinson yeah. uh, to watch her. I wanted to watch her, wanted to watch her, and all yeah. of a sudden it stops. And then your dad dies and something happens and you got you know, someone, you know, got coronavirus and all of a sudden yeah. you're like, Oh, she's back. You're like so much happened in my fucking life that that's the last person I want to see. I want to watch this stupid Filipino guy that's not even doing Who's just joking around online. Yeah. Well, totally. Um, so have that's, you seen that's my, that's my, that, that's how I'm going to blow up. Yeah. That's it. That's it. You get to, that, that's your, your, your path to glory, right? Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen any like interesting forms of comedy like that pop up since all this has happened? Yeah. I mean, honestly, like the, the show that we're doing, I mean, that sounds awesome. I haven't seen before, but I've done a meme show where I kind of took that idea and brought it into this show for sure. But it was, it was a five segment of all different types of memes, like a celebrity meme, mm -hmm. a regular meme, and then you get paid for this, right? So that was really fun. Hell yeah. yeah that sounds that, awesome. Yeah. So, and then another show I did was um, uh, an Asian show, and we all got the topics of talking about, like, we had to make these three or four things funny. One was, should, what do you think about, it being called the China virus. What do you think of this? And what do you think of this? And yeah. Not all of them was due to the pandemic or coronavirus. It was just topics. And like an open mic or like the debaters, you only had a week to practice or whatever. You could, there was no test audience. Oh, and you would, it, it wasn't like a, an open mic where you just, you just nonchalantly try something. Mm -hmm. You actually had to research and try to figure out something funny. And so that was kind of like the new norm. The new norm is, you can't rehearse shit. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's almost like the age of improv comedians could really be successful right now. Well, it's like, uh, you know, overseas, especially 15 years ago, you could really get on stage once a month. So that one time, like stage, a year, yeah. 
yeah, right. When you get on once a month, you, oh yeah, you're, I was talking to the guys out there. Yeah. So you basically have to use that uh, productively and you have to be uh, really intricate with everything you're saying because you don't want to lose that stage time. Now, Toronto, you can do five to 10 a night. Like yeah. if you really pushed it, you could, right? You don't tend to care what you're going to do in the next show. And what happens is you may be able to be tighter, but there's something about using that stage time productively more than, more than week Toronto can do. Toronto does that allows the concepts to be, to be boiling and rehashed and you Mm -hmm. can create the moment because you, in Toronto, you go fast, you Mm -hmm. know, you get, we got three style. minutes and you're going to do three minutes, 10 times that night. And you just, you know, the, you know, the steps so you're just trying to like push it out. Right. Yeah. So what are you practicing? A tight ass fucking three to five minutes. Now, if you go only get to go on stage one or twice a month, you're going to make that four to five minutes count. And, and every moment that you're going to, you're going to be on there, you're going to build to, something that's quality i don't think there's a better or worse i just think to work on five minutes you better go to a big city to work on concepts you don't really need to uh to do it the same way as 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 a toronto city you can you can actually practice on the road a bit you know yeah i think that's the thing that's been unique about up here is that i feel like our our comedians up here aren't necessarily like writing the tightest bits but what they're doing is they're coming up with they're going pretty deep into themselves to write interesting sort of uh, uh setups and concepts because every single show they have to write a new piece because it's the same audience every time so once a month you're getting the exact same audience so you can't write you can't craft a bit you have to go every show i gotta write a new five minutes which is crazy right. but so in that way you're learning another skill that other comics aren't as well so it doesn't mean that it's, it's better or worse it just no, means no. what you're taking advantage of your surroundings to come up with something that is professional looking and sometimes your whereabouts or where you live and your surroundings attributes to that like jerk chicken like jerk chicken was created <laughs> because it was this this is the stupidest analogy i love it but, but it's the funny one yeah jerk chicken like comedy was created to hide from the british okay so what they did was they killed the chickens <laughs> right seasoned them and then put them underground underground and, and put spice wood on top of it okay and spice leaves so what happened was the spice wood and the spice leaves would make it taste a certain way, but you couldn't see it. They couldn't do it with fire because they, they'd be caught. Yeah. They had to do coals, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So you guys are jerk chicken. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah, we are. <laughs> you guys have to practice in the worst environments. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Well, but that's the thing. I'll be really curious. Great- yeah. I'll be super curious to see like some of our comedians who had like got the chance to sort of like go through like a couple of years up here and then left and were working, uh, working out in like bigger cities. Like a great example was, uh, on your show, Marley treasure, the young, really young girl, uh, she was great. She's incredible. And I think that like you give her a few years, like she's now been in Toronto for I think maybe a year. Um, wow. Great. Yeah. It's going to be crazy to see what she's like. And she's like just finishing her program. Uh, I think she's got maybe one year, one more year at the, uh, at the, the mm-hmm. comedy uh, program down there. And I think yeah. after that, she, I think like she did a Just for Laughs showcase a few months ago up here and, and she was incredible. And I'm just like to take this sort of like idea where it's like now she's, she's sort of spent all of this time like working away and coming up with like different ways to come at comedy and then to go into a bigger city and go, okay, I know all of the things that I can talk about. Let's see if I can craft a five minute bit, like a a set together. I think it's, I think it potentially sets you up to be really successful because a lot of comedians take like decades to sort of go as deep as we've had to, because it's just like, every time I go on stage, I need to come up with something. I need to like look at my life in a different way. I need to like think about what is my comedy in a different way. And I think that it potentially sets you up for success. Yeah, because she's what she's doing is she's she's taking the jerk chicken she made, listen, and she's now selling it to a broad audience yeah. that needs it to be cooked faster. <laughs> yeah. So she's turning into KFC. Uh, so jerk chicken KFC. <laughs> yeah, because 
you know, I, 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 uh, I, I performed in Louisiana, Louis, mm -hmm. Louis, Louisville, Louisville, Louisville. Right? Yeah, Louisville, they call it. And uh, so I went to the original uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant called Sanders Cafe. Oh, shit. So that was the very first place they served chicken that was from this, the Colonel. Now, the original KFC was baked for 42, oh, wow. for 40, right, 20 minutes or something. Fuck 24 that. Minutes. He came out with the pressure cooker, right? Yeah. And he changed it. That was able to make it cook faster and also distribute it faster, right? Yeah. Uh, through the customers. And that's what, this sounds fucked up. But that's what these tiny fucking these big city needs because you can only get on five minute showcases. Yeah, you can't yeah. do you can't do thirty minutes anywhere in the city unless you're a big draw, mm -hmm. right? So you got to show your jerk chicken fast. <laughs> yeah, that sounds so stupid, but I swear <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, yeah, so you have to use a pressure cooker because an open mic is for you to do throw out the idea. A mm -hmm. book show, which is not a comedy club, it's just a book show that you get that specific people are booked there because they are liked as comedian respected. It mm -hmm. allows you to come up with the creativity that works. Now, the, the comedy club allows you to broaden it. Mm -hmm. And then the road allows you to make it universal, right? Until you get a following and then you go back to one where it's just really specific again. Yeah, absolutely. No, I completely agree with you. Um, I, so I have a few questions that I always ask every comedian because I think it's really interesting uh, to hear your perspective on it because I think no, during times like these, there's nobody who's better prepared for like being alone a lot of the time and like being quarantined as comedians, right? Uh, but it's also easy to succumb to like depression and stuff like that, the same thing, which I also think that comedians are, are pretty well versed in. So. Um, I, I always, I like to ask every performer, if you can think back on your sort of comedy career up to this point, um, and if there's anything that comes to mind when you start thinking of like success in your career, now, whether that's like an opportunity you were given, a person that you met, a joke that you were able to make work, but when you look back in your career, like moments that like stand out to you is like, these were moments where I felt success in my career. Um, for sure, when I first got promoted for yuck yucks for uh hell yeah that was 19 that was in my my I, I did comedy for one full year uh i basically met russell peters and he was like hey just go on the road for me for a year only work on five whatever works keep what doesn't work throw away that's all i have to tell you wow. just do what i said so i did that after one year he goes okay mark breslin this is kid i've been on, on the road for a year i think he's seasoned enough for your five minute showcase tomorrow uh, the next week he put me on i killed I didn't even know what I was doing. This guy wow. was basically telling me what to do. And I was listening like Mike Tyson. And, uh, and, and then eventually Mark goes, all right, we're promoting you. You're going to be on for six months. And I'm going to see you again. And if you kill it again, then guess what? You'll be a working comic. So I did it. Killed after six months. He put me on the road with Mike Wilmont in Yuck Yuck's Comedy Club in, uh, in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. He goes, and the gig sheet said 25 minutes. I was like, <laughs> I've only been doing fives for a year and a half. Like wow. I only had five, wow. like maybe seven. And after I'm like, oh my God. So I went up <laughs> and I tried to stretch as long as I did. I did eight minutes. Mm -hmm. I got off stage. The MC ran back while passing me in the alley. He goes, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> he did another 10, brought the headliner. And he did another 20 or something or 50. Yeah. So the manager, Howard Wagman, who's still the manager there, he call, He goes, Ron, what the hell was that? I'm like, I don't know. I, that's all I got. He calls Mark, puts him on speaker, goes, yeah, you promoted this Ron Jossel guy. Yeah, yeah, he's great. He's like, he only did eight minutes. Well, put him on the phone. Ron, how come he only did eight minutes? I go, well, you said, because I'm, I'm quoting him. Yeah. At a, at a, the, the, the first time I we went to Yuck Yucks, he was speaking to all the young comedians in a seminar. Mm -hmm. And he says, all you need is five minutes. You can get any club. So I go, the first time I went to Yucky because I saw you do a seminar. He goes, yes, I remember doing that seminar. And you said, all you need is five minutes. You get any club in the world. So I only worked in five minutes. And now I'm in the club. <laughs> and he goes, all right, well, you're in. But guess what? After this weekend, I'm going to book you every single weekend for six months. And you better 
be on the stage for at least 20 minutes. And <laughs> oh I don't God. care if you bomb. <laughs> and by the end of that six months, I'm going to come to your show. And if you don't kill in 20 minutes, I'm firing you. Holy shit. I've never written that much in my life. <laughs> in fact, my first two months, I was dying so much that I didn't hurt anymore. Wow. And I went, wow, I needed that. I needed to die and yeah. not be afraid of death. Even though I was afraid before and after, Yeah, uh, I, it was never as bad as what I, f I you get comfortable with shit. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, this is how women stay in shitty relationships and get beat up. <laughs> oh my God. And then I, after a while, got used to it. After a while, I started doing better. After a while, every joke started working more. And all of a sudden, he came and I killed it. And that was it. And so that was kind of like, I know it doesn't mean anything. It's such a small part of my whole thing I've done. Yeah. But that's what I remember the most. That's important. And the second part is getting into my first comedy club in the United States. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the first time. Where was that? So... One of Yuck Yuck's ex-bookers liked me a lot. And so he was like, hey, I have a friend that's our agent in New York City. If you're going to be in New York anytime soon, let me know. So I was like, yeah, I'm actually going to go next week. So I went there. I went on stage. He was there. He, he basically goes, oh, well, I'd like to be your agent. I'm like, wow. oh, man, that's amazing. He's like, yeah. So I'm going to start featuring you, which is middling, mm -hmm. in all these clubs. So he booked me across America. And I broke even every fucking time I went because I had to take my gas money, I had to drive to Pittsburgh, yeah. I had to drive to Boston, I had to drive to fucking Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And I didn't make any money. I was I had some places I had stay, places to stay, some places I didn't. Right. But as soon as they saw me, they go, next time you come back, you're going to have money. And like 80% wow. of these clubs I've been, right? So, I mean, I haven't played these places maybe in 10, 15 years, but sure. maybe 15. Sure. But I mean, there was a, there was a club in, in uh, Milwaukee, a club in in um pittsburgh a club in florida like all these clubs that the that were made me allowed me to headline there mm -hmm. that was one of my first times um I, I actually made it in my head that's i mean that's huge right i mean the that that's that's the the validation i think you need right like not only at that point you're 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 validated as like oh my stuff works beyond canada it works in the united states yeah right like and then and headlining, you know, and doing well at places you never dreamed that you would do well at. Yeah. You know, so th those that's like the second. Like I've done just for the first time I did just for laughs. Uh, gala was a big deal, I guess. Um, you know, and, and a lot of the times it was, it was always when I stopped caring about getting, getting the thing, whatever it is, right? Yeah, it was always like. I, I auditioned for just, sorry, just for last, I won their competition in 1998 mm -hmm. uh, called the Craven A Up and Comer Just for Last Comedy Fest, uh, comedy show. So I won, I did, the, I did a competition in Toronto, I won it. And there were 10 others, there were like eight other provinces that were doing the same competition. All eight of us would go to the actual Just for Last Fest and compete to win. I didn't win the fast part, but I got into Just for Laughs. Mm -hmm. I won my region. And, um, and then finally, I'm, I'm in Just for Laughs. And it took me 10 years to come back to Just for Laughs. And I showcased every year and never got it. The year I got it, I didn't showcase. Wow. Isn't that crazy? It's funny how things yeah. work out. Um, yeah, that's that one question. That's answers, awesome. But... No, that's great. That's that's awesome. I think that it's interesting, right? Because you sometimes people might think it's like the hugest things that you get, and it's like you don't necessarily need to get the big things to feel success. Sometimes it's just about like it's about like uh, going it over over a hurdle or like achieving some small thing that that leads to everything else that's big. But those are the it's the small things that tend to mean the most. I think. Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, and as a last question, uh, I like to ask everybody, which is, do you have any tips for surviving right now? What are you doing to sort of like keep yourself sane and spend your time, especially when you have to quarantine? Well, this is something I've also seen on television, but I also knew kind of consciously or subconsciously on my own. On my own. For sure. Uh, to practice social distancing mm -hmm. 
is also kind of destroying your soul. Yeah, man. Because when you, when you distance thing, if you distance yourself from humans, uh, you don't live long. You don't feel good. It's the same way of a, 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 a hamster will live longer with other hamsters. Yeah. Right? It's true. Uh, to counter that, you need to speak to people more every day. Mm-hmm. Because especially if you're by yourself, I'm by myself, which I'm used to, so it's no big deal. But sure. if you live with your family, it's a little easier. But if you're not, and even if you're living with your family, you get bored of them. You got to fucking call people and have conversations throughout the yeah. whole day. Because the, the less social, uh, the more social distance. I, I'm, you know who I'm quoting a lot? I'm quoting Newton a lot. I'm quoting oh, Newton wow. every second. I'm saying for every action, Mm-hmm. There's an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah. So for every time we're social distancing, we're destroying ourselves. Yeah, man. So we Absolutely. got to counter that by doing an action that does the opposite. So let's counter social distancing with talking to people three, four times a day. That's genius. I mean, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I like that analogy. That's great. So that what, why wouldn't that be the opposite reaction of, yeah. of the actual pain we're feeling in our souls being distancing? So that's my number one thing right now. That's and awesome. the word calmness has to constantly be in your head. Mm-hmm. Like, how do I achieve calmness? What do I do to sort of You got to be calm. You got to be calm through this whole thing because everybody's blood is boiling. Yeah. You know, absolutely. everybody's a ticking time bomb. You're snapping left and right. Last night, or two nights ago, I snapped at a lady who was not giving me the space behind me in the, in the, in the, uh, when we, in the grocery store. Oh, yeah. Store. Yeah. I've, I've gotten like, close to that. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you got to be calm. You got to be calm because this is so unusual for our bodies and our minds to take. So we all have to do more Zooms. We have to do more talking on the phone. We have to yeah. pretend we're in high school. We got to be, constantly on the phone like a fucking schoolgirl, <laughs> like a jerk chicken school <laughs> hey man that jerk chicken analogy is the best analogy I've ever had in my life. genius all right thanks so much man I, it was great talking to you again no problem man hey nice to meet nice to talk to you it's always a pleasure hope to see you soon man be safe brother you're fucking a great guy thanks man you too all right i'll talk to you all later all right later